Hello again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch, and I hope you enjoyed the morning. And we will be coming now to our last of the five thematic sessions. Um, uh, and uh, it's my quick pleasure to introduce my, my dear colleague, uh, Ben Buschfeld, to be the host for panel or session number five. And uh, uh, as you already heard, I'm working, well, Ben and I are working closely for the triennial of uh, modernism in Berlin and uh, also for the European triennial project. Ben is a designer, graduated diploma designer um, with a very multidisciplinary background awarded uh, 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 as an author for uh, creative projects uh, all around uh, basically uh, the, the heritage of uh, modernism. Uh, he founded uh, uh, Bushfeld.com, a graphic and interface design uh, agency and runs um, a rentable museum about the 1920s architecture dedicated to the work of Bruno Taut, which is called Tautesheim, for what you have to be German to understand uh, the joke. It's like you say in German, Trautesheim, when something is a very welcoming place to, to stay, like a, a welcoming house. So this is like a wordplay with Trautesheim and Tautesheim, um, at, uh, it, which is also awarded, uh, of course, with the European Heritage Award. 2013, he was one of the founders uh, before I actually joined uh, to the Triennia, Triennale der Moderne, like the German edition, tri Triennial of Modernism between Berlin, Dessau, and Weimar. And he helped uh, to establish not only the festival, but he also provided the design and developed the whole CI. Uh, together with me, we acted, as said, as the curators uh, for the triennial program in Berlin, um, 2019, first time in that, in that teaming, and then again 2020. Um, ben is a member of uh, various uh, networks, um, like German Werkbund, uh, um, Berlin Dokomomo, Germany, Kultur Urban Netz Berlin, which is like a cultural network for Berlin uh, heritage and uh, international network uh, iconic houses, of course, because of this marvelous uh, mu little museum he runs himself. Uh, he has initiated several heritage projects, for example, a monument preservation database for the Hufeisen Siedlung in uh, Berlin Brits, um, a red list of threatened buildings in Berlin, and uh, as well an educational website about the UNESCO World Heritage Berlin Modernism Housing Estate. And besides he being the host of this final round, he will um, also start, as I, as I, uh, as I know, um, to somehow give you a little insight to, the, to this Berlin uh, Modern Housing Estates heritage as its six settlements here, which, um, which are awarded UNESCO World Heritage. And uh, as this topic uh, will be uh, on uh, modern housing, uh, I think this is appropriate to start, of course, with a little bit of local um, information um, and then catching up to the discussion. So Ben, uh, the floor is yours. So yeah. Thank you for the uh, nice <laughs> introduction. So basically, I'm, I'm not a scholar. I'm rather a designer who uh, went into the position to become an activist and now pretending to be a scholar. <laughs> uh, not really. <laughs> um, but um, since we are in Berlin, but only had the one uh, lecture uh, or the one Berlin topic by Mr. Rauhut, um, we thought it's uh, also good um, if we just tell you a bit about the local situation and how it comes that Berlin really is a metropolis of modernism with a reach uh, oeuvre starting from industrial industrialization to interwar to late century modernism in eastern and western parts and so on and so forth. And um, just to outline the dimensions of this uh, issue, 
Berlin has like more than 8,000 uh, entries on the lists of monuments, single entries and also ensemble entries, and about one third of that can be counted as 20th century heritage. So there's really a, a lot uh, to see in this city. And as you might also know, um, we have three World Heritage Sites, the Prussian Palaces and Gardens in Berlin and Potsdam, the Museums Insel in Mitte, and also these uh, six uh, housing estates, which are probably the most prominent contribution uh, of Berlin to the international architectural history. And this is why I would like to give you a very brief, really brief uh, shortcut of the preconditions why Berlin uh, became such a, a, a hotspot. <laughs> So basically, um, Berlin from 1815 onwards uh, was a prosperous and fast-growing city with traffic, as you see, and more and more industries settling down at the outskirts of the former Electropolis. This is Kabelwerk Oberspree in Oberschöneweide. But um, you might have not heard of this, this one, but other companies like Siemens AEG, of course, we are all familiar with. Um, as an effect of that, Berlin was back then one of the most crowded cities in the world, which is shown in this uh, little famous uh, graphic. And the predominant uh, residential architecture were the so-called perimeter blocks or rental barracks. So this is the typical worker district architecture uh, in Berlin were a series of courtyards. This iconic picture of the Mayersche Höfe in Wedding, you probably know. And inside, these courtyards uh, looked like this. And this is where the mass of uh, rather average or poor people uh, lived. And since density was such a problem, many of them shared their flat with other families or really lived in the uh, basement of the fifth, sixth courtyard. So these were typical living conditions back then. So there was a need to build on large scale. This is a map from 1885, and you see um, former Berlin, quite small, if you compare it with this one. Because back then, this was a clever uh, political movement. Um, that politicians try to unite former Berlin with a number of mid-sized towns and uh, villages around. And in 1920, Great Berlin was founded. And as you see, comparing those two areas, um, size increased by the factor of 13. So this gave us the land and the opportunity to really build on large scale. So these are all markers of uh, residential estates from the 1920s and 30s. Um, Berlin is probably, besides Frankfurt and Magdeburg, the dominant hotspot for this 1920s modernism, but it was also including many other cities. Um, another political, uh, political influence was that uh, hyperinflation was overcome by also by introducing um, the house income tax with, uh, gave us the opportunity to have money to really build on large scale after 1924. There were many um, housing associations founded. This one is probably the most famous one, the GEHAC, um, which is quite cleverly constructed and uh, was building a lot of residential developments. They immediately started in 1924. These are some advertisements from the GEHAG and from the political parties that back them up. And these are the most, uh, most important men. Martin Wagner, the city planning director from 1926 onwards, and Bruno Taut, who was hired as the chief architect of uh, the GEHAG. These are the six uh, residential estates that got uh, jointly listed as a UNESCO World Heritage. And they span um, the development from the Garden City movement towards large-scale housing. Um, this is the estate where I personally uh, live in. It's the biggest and probably the most famous one and also the most challenging one uh, because of this. 
because we had the same thing that happened elsewhere in the world in the 90s, privatization. The GEHAC portfolio was sold and um, our houses were the most prominent spot. Uh, row houses with gardens pretty close to the city. Of course, um, this was a big issue for preservation. If you imagine a few hundred people uh, are owning a world heritage and are responsible for preservation. So we came up with a number of uh, things that uh, could also be mentioned in the last panel as the good practice, founding a private association in order to run fundings on certain projects, for instance, this one, which is the database Robert mentioned. It's containing 2,000 microsites for all individual dwellings. We had um, detailed plans like this with all colors, materials, and stuff. And this was issued 2011. And then um, we turned a former um, store into a kind of cafe, museum, neighborhood uh, um, collecting spot. And, um, well, I published about the, the World Heritage Estates in print and online, um, which gives us an opportunity to lead uh, tourism in a certain path, uh, which is not too offending. And in a way, also, the Triennial got out of this uh, process because back in 2012, Jörg Haspel, who was uh, the state conservator at that time, who spoke yesterday, um, he uh, invited a few people for a brainstorming and the basic question was, what can we do in order to communicate our newest world heritage? And um, as a fact of that, we found this construction in Germany with Weimar, Dessau, and Berlin, and uh, now trying to get this on a European level. And a short advertising block, if uh, tomorrow you feel uh, like you have still time, if you are not capable of uh, understanding German, if you are, then Hans and Van Stiftung is also an option. But if you are not, um, we have a short tour looking at building section one, two, and six, and uh, experience the mastership of Bruno Taut's color and, and other designs, and also visit uh, this uh, rental museum, as mentioned. So this was the short, uh, really uh, wrapping up of uh, some specific Berlin um, situations. And now about the panel. Uh, the next panel will be new communities, new buildings, new people. The notion of the new with capital N uh, in Central and Eastern European modern architecture. And we know that the new man and the new building is predominantly associated with the 1920s and this enormous, uh, uh, how to call it, uh, explosion of uh, modernist and reform-orientated movement, but it also appeared uh, after World War II, when uh, whole Europe was in ruins, and these are a few things that we want to discuss on the panel, and therefore I invite all the panelists to come on stage. Um, Yeah, please <laughs> come here to join us. So. Yeah, the first one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, will you introduce me, yeah? Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> I need <to>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Nadia Antonienko, um, I introduce her, is a senior lecturer um, from the Department of Information Technology and Architecture at the Kiev National University of Construction and Architecture. She's also a guest researcher at the Department for Raum and Umweltplanung at rheinland pfälzische Technical University in Kaiserslautern Landau. She graduated from the uh, Faculty of Architecture at Kharkiv Technical University of Civil Engineering and Architecture, received her bachelor's degree in 2009, her master's degree in 2010. She defended her PhD thesis on the architecture at Kharkiv National University of Civil Engineering, and she works as an architect uh, at the design office, oh, hopefully I spell it right, Kharkiv Stroin Approach, Brooked. Project. <laughs> Brooked, okay. Um, 
from 2007 until 2009 as a designer and a promoter of exhibitions at the Kharkiv Nash uh, Regional Organizational and Methodological Center of Culture and Arts until 2014. As an assistant professor of the Department of Fundamentals of Architecture at Kharkiv National University, again, until 2016. And today, she acts as a senior lecturer of the Department of Information Technologies in Architecture at Kiev National University of Construction to the present. So the floor is yours, and she will speak about large housing estates in Ukrainian cities from the 1960s to 80s. Thank you for your kind introduction for me. Uh, I want to tell you that now my current research, uh, which funded by VHV in Berlin, uh, is about a post-war urban development of large-scale mass housing estates of 80s in Ukraine, potentials and prospects. This yellow, yellow? Yeah. Large-scale housing estates of 1960s, 1980s are a special type of modernist heritage. The scale of implemented urban planning projects is amazing. In almost every city in Ukraine, we can see districts occupying huge areas with monotonous serial prefabricated buildings. Why do I say this heritage is special? First of all, in view of its scale, it is impossible to even think about conserving or museumizing these territories, or even part of them. This is a territory of living urban space with constantly changing social conditions and contexts. We cannot stop natural transformation processes, so questions of authenticity and integrity of the original idea are outside the discourse. Large-scale housing estates were created within the framework of ideological ideas about an utopian just society. They didn't reflect the current needs of the residents. Their speciality demonstrated a possible future constructed way of life when people would live under communism, ensuring a fair and complete distribution of goods among themselves. The problem is, is that this society never existed. Spaces were created for people who never existed. I think their speciality is not human scale, but majestic. It's for a giant person who is comfortable in such big empty places. I have my doubts that these spaces were created to humiliate the human being, to unify, depersonalize, dissolve individuality. Even during the Soviet era, in these spaces, different people grown. I am in favor of not demonizing any living environment. Fact is after 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet administrative common system, people are continuing to live in these environments. They bought flats here, set up businesses, raised their children. Given the general low standard of living of the population, these areas have not become obviously stigmatized in Ukraine. Before the war, I tried to identify the grounds of what large-scale housing estates should be protected. You can see a list of the main ideas. Preserve as exemplars of innovation in urban planning, inventions that have subsequently had development and influence in the future. Preserve as a heritage of outstanding urban planners of Ukraine, whose names are little known. Formation of the pantheon of Ukrainian urban planners to separate the Ukrainian school of urban planning from all Soviet Moscow-centered urban planning. Third, preserve as object of architectural and artistic value, compositional and combinatorial games in strict condition of economic visibility, implementation of the principle of resource optimization. 
and the force presupposes places of individual and collective memory about everyday life, which has developed over more than 50, 60 years, relying on sociological researchers drawing spatial mental maps. I tried to find correspondence in the changes in spatiality and internal historical and cultural references that had developed at different levels of urban design, in the morphology of buildings, in changes in functional programs, in the use of green public spaces, in traffic trajectories, in, sure. and in objects of monumental and street art. This work would be continued. It would most likely make sense in further transformation to be guided by the achievements and practical work of the former Eastern Bloc countries, which have experience in renovating their post-socialist neighborhoods and monitoring their development after changes, to compare this situation and find solutions for our places. However, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has given a new impetus to rethinking the meaning and value of large-scale housing estates in Ukraine. It turned out that the first three positions on preservation are impossible, even at the level of professional discourse. I, a person who worried about the preservation and promotion of the modernist heritage as a valuable object of world culture for years, said to myself, as soon as the rocket attacks began, I want people to be alive, not buildings. And this is a radical change in the semantic framework of the value structure. The main value in this context is the preservation of the utilitarian function of large-scale housing estate as a habitat. The main thing is that a person should survive. That he or she should keep his health that she, he, should have walls and windows, and inside the house, heat, food, medicine, electricity. The war revealed which key spatial and functional frameworks allow a housing estate to survive. Survival is a new facet of the identity of the housing estates, which creates a new fan of places of symbolic memory, places of common pain, fear, burial, and local heroism. The critical situation imposed the political nature of the architecture of Soviet modernism. In many works by researchers of modernism, repeatedly raised the issue of the problem of fusion of architecture and urban design and the attempt to reconstruct society. The expression of extreme right-wing and left-wing ideas through architectural means. With the outbreak of the war, there has been a rejection of the Soviet legacy in society in Ukraine and its association with pro-Russian political narratives. This is because Russian propaganda has been reanimating visual e images of Soviet aesthetic for 20 years, using them as symbolic replications to signify its new regime. In Ukraine, the society's rejection of Russia as an aggressor was reflected in the intensified policy of decommunization and desovitization, which began in 2014 and was further defined as Russification, derussification. Since in Ukraine, there was no sustainable public support of preserving object of modernist architecture before war, after 24th of February, the process leads to the spontaneous destru destruction of everything that an ordinary citizen would associate with the Soviet Russian narrative. Fighting for Soviet period at monumentality, architectural or urban planning object as a monument, even at the level of Ukrainian intellectual communities, become very hard because it falls within the realm of ethics. However, the war showed the other side. 
my assumption that people are attached to the large, high, large scale housing estates in which they lived was also explicitly shown. As soon as the Russian troops withdrew from Kiev, Chernigov, Kharkiv, Kherson, and the shelling became less intense, people returned to their homes. As much as they could, they restored their flats and houses themselves. People began to form stronger local social nets. There appeared a personal living of history in the moment with attachment to a specific area of the housing estate, which got a deeper connotation. My home, my place, the place I want to live in, the place I will not give up. Through the injuries of war, home have received their individualization. It should be noted that there have also been dramatic demographic changes that have affected of large-scale housing estate identity. On the one hand, some people became closer to their homes. For others, there has been a loss of connection to home. A huge number of people have never moved away. But at the same time, someone new with their own backgrounds has come to housing estates from more devastated and dangerous place. And these large-scale housing estates became a new home for them, symbolic as a safe heaven. And when we talk about identity formation in such acute conditions, we no longer relate it to the past and to the past stories of the people who changed the speciality of this place from construction year after year. Identity is about the present. It is a present moment after and before the next shelling that determines that the housing estate represents now who represents it, and what value it holds. In my opinion, a new identity of large-scale housing estates of Ukrainian cities is being formed now. It will be formed through internal processes that will leave their imprints in speciality. They will depend on local residents, on physical damage, on the duration of the war. But also important will be decision-making at the city level to find there an answer to the question, what is post-war Kiev, Kharkiv, Odessa, Kherson, Lviv? Today, intra-city discussions about the future with local residents, professionals, and authorities are critically important. On these frameworks will depend on what system of relations some large scale, scale housing estate will be included in and what system of values it will be able to reproduce. I hope that this basic value will be a human life, a little utopian, but deeply humanistic in essence, similar to the one that was proclaimed by city planners in the socialistic era. The only difference is that reality will accept imperfection, individuality, diversity of real life people. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. We also um, keep the scheme that uh, you memorize your questions and in the final round uh, we will ask everyone um so then i would uh, like margot zata bulkot to come over here um margot zata bulkot is an independent uh, researcher from in berlin um She's an architect. She graduated from Krakow University of Technology in Poland and at HAKW, HAWK Hildesheim in Germany in 2014 with a project researching and preserving a potato warehouse built as part of the former Auschwitz concentration camp. Um, the dissertation dealt with the problem of a shared German-Polish architectural heritage of World War II. She has practiced in the Netherlands, Poland, and Germany, working on buildings, interiors, and exhibition. 
She's a collaborator of Contactum Architecture, and her main research interests are commemoration and lost heritage in architecture and urbanism as well as gentrification and co-creation as urban processes. She's an enthusiast of modernism and an admirer of rural architecture. And you will see what uh, is meant by this. <laughs> so the orange one. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Burkot, and I'm an architect and a set independent researcher. Uh, who was honored to receive uh, Exercising Modernity uh, grant last year. I received the grant uh, to learn more about the campaign uh, for the construction of 100 uh, new school buildings in the former province um, of Vilnius. Uh, in uh, the next 10 minutes, uh, I intend to uh, describe the building uh, campaign and its history, then quickly show what I found out about the schools in the process, uh, show some historic plans as well as some recent pictures, then quickly so show some examples um, of similar schools um, in the other countries, and in the end maybe I will have time to conclude. Uh, while I was... Um, reading the book, uh, The Piłsudski Cult and its Significance uh, for the Polish State by Heidi Hein uh, Kircher, I came across uh, the quote that on the occasion of the first anniversary of Piłsudski's death in 1936, the Council of Ministers decided to build 100 schools named after Piłsudski in Vilnius region, which were completed by October 1937 and inaugurated at the central event in Bezdane. And I thought, um, what is that? How is it possible? And this is why I am here now. Uh, shortly to introduce the figure of Piłsudski, who is not familiar uh, with Polish history, maybe um, Piłsudski was a fighter for Polish independence and one of uh, founding fathers um, of the newly reunite, reunited country after the First World War. Piłsudski later became a political leader and a real yet not formal dictator of the country. He, had a, he was called Marshal. Piłsudski was much loved and much hated. Um, anyway, the state-run cult of the Marshal was important symbolic element uh, and ideological denominator of the newly reunited country. After Piłsudski's death in 1935, numerous commemorative initiatives were funded to honor his memory, and hundreds of schools were one of them. This map shows the distribution of Poles, or rather Polish-speaking people, uh, and um, the map was created in 1915, so right after the war, when um, it was not yet sure what shape the, the, the newly, new country will discover. The uh, intention of Poland was uh, to recreate Poland in the borders from the, before the partitions. Um, so the map shows the, the, the violet line, uh, shows the out outline from 1775. Uh, but to me, more than the Polish people, this uh, map shows the polyculturality of the region. Um, and if we would read here, it says that from the former, former Prussian uh, partition, the number referring to some, uh, some estimations, um, the Germans were um, um, deducted uh, from, for, from the red color, and in Galicia, uh, where I'm personally from, uh, the Jews who um, spoke Polish were removed uh, from, the, um, from the red color. It was not even intended for the, for the Vilnius region. Uh, it was, yeah. Um, but this answers the question. Uh, also, Piłsudski came uh, from, uh, from Vilnius uh, or from this region and was raised there. So it answers the question why uh, Lithuanians had to create um, the temporary uh, capital city, not in Vilnius, which is historically their, their capital, um, but in Kaunas, uh, which we listened um, about yesterday. 
Uh, this is um, the newspaper clipping that was cited by the researcher I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, what piqued my curiosity that after I found um, uh, this clipping um, that was announcing the, the project, uh, I haven't found many other um, sources. Uh, and to answer the question why the schools fell into this um, research uh, gap, I can support myself by the research of Michał uh, Pszukowski, who um, later published books of, pub of uh, public architecture in interwar Poland. Uh, and he, um, he says that um, one of the reasons um, for the school projects not to be popular in the architectural research, not only the 100 schools, but many other school buildings from, from the time, uh, was that they were not ever mentioned in Architektura and Budownictwo, Architektura i Budownictwo, architectural magazine uh, that is the source of most uh, architectural research on uh, modernity in Poland. They were not uh, following most valuable modernist style of functionalism, um, but also uh, soon after the inauguration of the, um, uh, of the schools, the uh, Second World War broke out and uh, the schools uh, were suddenly standing not anymore in, the, in this new country of Poland, but in the Soviet states of Lithuania and Belarus. Uh, another um, uh, reason that uh, none of the Polish re researchers were interested in the topic was probably the fact that uh, all the documents um, in the Ministry of uh, Public Education were uh, lost in the Warsaw Uprising, so no one could uh, come across them in the archival visits. Um, one of the uh, first and best sources of information that I came across is um, the official journal of Vilnius um, School Curatorium, um, which uh, describes the pompous event of opening the 100 schools in uh, uh, inauguration party in Bezdany. Mm, mm, the, uh, oh, the president of Poland at the time, uh, Mościcki, was, uh, was in Bezdane and the widow of Piłsudski as well. We can see them in the picture. Also because the 100 schools were opened at the same time in the square in front of the school, the um, delegations of uh, children from the villages were holding the banners opening um, in this sense the, their own uh, schools. The um, inauguration was um, casted live on uh, national radio in uh, all Poland. Another thing that we can find in this uh, um, little bulletin is um, uh, are the first uh, pictures of the schools that I saw. It was very helpful and it was um, uh, confirming my hypothesis uh, that this had to be some kind of um, a typical um, uh, um, project um, as well as the full list of the of the schools uh, together with the little map that uh, shows not only the, the villages but also uh, the size of the schools. Uh, in, uh, in the Lithuanian Central uh, State Archive, um, I was surprised with the abundance of plans um, and um, detailed documents about the buildings. Uh, here, uh, mm, here are three situational plans that were used in the uh, fastness proceedings for building permit. And from here we can see that the buildings, uh, or that the buildings um, uh, had an L shape, were placed not directly by the um, by the road. Uh, there were also uh, outbuildings. Uh, and toilets, and there was always a well on the side. Uh, there were gardens for the, uh, for the teacher and for the kids. It depends, like here's for the teacher, here for the kids, and a playground also. The red lines are corrections from the voyevod ship, um, stating that maybe probably unifying the, the kind of placement of the schools on the, on the plots. Uh, and this is one of the uh, plans of the schools. They, not on, they don't all look the same, but they all follow a similar 
principle of the, uh, they usually have, they usually have an entrance at the at the corner, following to the uh, wide corridor that is called um, recreational area. Um, the classes, um, the changing room, office, and then behind the um, the fire wall, there is a flat for for the teacher. In this case, it's interesting because there are some corrections with the with the pencil placed. Uh, the entrance shouldn't be at the at the corner. Um, they state that the entrance here is maybe better. It would uh, make extension of the school possible. So it would be, it would have then not the L shape, but the U shape. Um, there are also um, details that are typical. The, all the project consists of, the, of this little situation plans and then uh, and then uh, this copied um, details. And here we can see um, what was uh, important to the architects who, who designed the buildings. It was ventilation um, in sense of the, uh, of the ventilation of the rooms. The windows have different sizes depending on uh, if, it's, if it's in the corridor or in the, in the classroom. But there is also ventilation of the air circulation around the Floor, there bitumen uh, insulation between uh, fundaments and the wooden structure is always stated very uh, as a very important part. And the most curious detail is probably this Doric-like column that is the symbol and emblem of all the schools. There are some more details. Not all the schools have pictures in their um, in their files, but Udicum school does, and here we can see even the uh, pictures during the construction of the school, and then when it's ready, the kids in front of, uh, in front of the building. Now, the, uh, during uh, my uh, visit in Lithuania, I visited uh, 10 of the schools that I was able to find on the maps, and uh, because of the lack of time, I will just click through this. Uh, sometimes there, is, there are still schools, like, like this school. Sometimes there are some other cultural uh, initiatives in the schools. Sometimes they stand empty, and sometimes they are not to find anymore. Uh, answering the question, who is the um, architect of the schools? I don't know that yet, uh, but I'm pretty sure that they were designed in the Ministry of Religious Affairs and Public Education in Warsaw. Uh, this is another document uh, that shows typical schools uh, that were um, said to be um, used uh, for free. There's, I haven't found the uh, Lithuanian schools in the, uh, in the pamphlets, but uh, these floor plans look a little bit similar. The detail is different, but it's, um, there are similarities. The leader of the workshop, architectural workshop in the ministry was, was Zdzisław Mączyński, aeronaut, um, Warsaw architect, who also designed the ministry building itself. And now changing uh, uh, scale a little bit and uh, to look above the borders, um, I want to show some examples um, that uh, of similar schools or like schools of similar size and also placed in a rural areas uh, in other countries. Uh, here is uh, Italy and um, one of Mussolini's flagship um, projects uh, drying up the Pontina marshes in, in the 30s. The schools were also designed for, for the villages. Um, they um, also refer to the, to the original architecture uh, in uh, uh, Hungary, uh, ministry um, built uh, people schools, um, and um, between 26 and 30, uh, 5,000 new elementary school rooms uh, were established. Uh, we can also um, see um, resembles of regional architecture in here. Uh, in uh, Switzerland and uh, Luxembourg, the situation was a little bit different, and I know this is an, an older e example, um, but there, first, the, the, the local schools were redesigned to be, uh, have this more uh, city-like um, appearance, but then in 1905, the Swiss Heritage Society was funded 
uh, to safeguard both physical and cultural aspects uh, linked to the national identity. And um, they stated that the schoolhouse is a silent co-educator of, um, uh, of the school uh, children and um, uh, by empathizing the role of um, um, that they say think that the, the schools should reflect the community character and um, design the schools should align with the local traditions. Um, this is a Greek example also um, also looking up to the uh, Byzantine uh, housing and in another uh, paper I even um, the, the researchers even suggested that we should uh, trace the rural school over the Atlantic and, and into the one room, room um, American schools from uh, the late um, 1900s. Now, um, slowly uh, finishing up um, a little bit about the layers and about my method, how I was looking for the schools. I found it the easiest to just draw by hand the, uh, the current border between the states. So here is Lithuania, here is Belarus, and Poland is not even on the map. Um, what, um, I, I, I don't know. I will just click, I, I'm, I'm stressed by the lack of time. Uh, so I was, I was, this, this uh, zero number is looking at me. Uh, so I will maybe not go in detail about, about this example, which is pretty, uh, pretty nice. Uh, a little family bought this school to make it their, their family home, uh, a Lithuanian couple. But because of the lack of resources, they, they really want to, they love their, their new home. Uh, but they basing the um, uh, the reparations on the oral history from uh, from the villagers, and they told them that the school used to have the um, red roof, and they were happy that I could uh, confirm that that I in in the uh, in the papers that I was looking through, it was a longer discussion what color should uh, the roof have and. Um, and it is red, but the buildings are not listed monuments of any kind. So uh, the family is also not getting any support in their, in their reparations. This is the building inside. And um, to uh, conclude, <laughs> regarding the uh, topic of the panel, the notion of new, uh, schools uh, brought the, the new form of social and uh, community life to the rural areas. The idea of the new citizens, uh, of the new democratic national um, state needed new function and had to be followed with the new typology and the new form. The schools are expression of international architectural trends intertwined uh, with uh, local building traditions and designed by the renowned architects, um, probably. <laughs> I mean, uh, bringing the Doric column to the rural Lithuania um, by building a Polish school, I find it's an it's a exotic mix altogether. And I want to leave with the question that I personally uh, don't know how to answer how can we as architects and researchers support the monumental protection of the common heritage left behind the shifting borders in the multi-layered and polycultural rural areas. Thank you. So thank you very much, Michael Zata. The next uh, speaker will be Katarina Didenko. She will talk about the laboratory for the formation of the new Soviet men, again, the new, um, but in a different context. Katarina Didenko graduated from Kharkiv National University of Construction and Architecture, a name that will appears uh, in her <laughs> vita quite a lot, in 2005 with a degree of architectural environment design, defending a master thesis on Mugini Mu, mu difficult word, municipal housing program for the center of Kharkiv. And in 2019, she defended her PhD dissertation on social housing programs in the architecture of metropolitan Kharkiv in between 1917 and 1934, 
at the Kharkiv National University. There she was an assistant of the Department of Architecture and Fundamentals from 2006 to 2020, an associate professor at the, um, uh, of the Institute of Architecture of Vilnius Gedimias Technical University. And from January 2023, she has been an associate professor of the Department of Architecture Design of um, O.M. Berketov um, in the uh, Kharkiv National University of Construction and Architecture. No, sorry, sorry, I was misled. <laughs> so long. <laughs> you can correct me, <laughs> anyhow. Um, her primary research areas uh, are social aspects of modernist architecture, social housing programs in the architecture of first, the third of the 20th century, the history of architecture and urban planning in pre-Soviet, Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine. So, floor. Thank you yours. for this introduction. So, okay. Uh, the topic, this is laboratory for the formation of a new Soviet man, the case study early modern architecture of residential complexes in metropolitan Kharkiv. I would like to just to, to say that um, uh, this is a kind of view, a kind of look. So it's of course not of the all of aspects of the architecture of interwar architecture uh, of Kharkiv, um, but uh, we we will concentrate on uh, to focus on on this aspect. And uh, I would like to say that this is my beloved city and beloved architecture. So, uh, Kharkiv was the capital of Ukraine from 1919 till 1934, and during these years, hundreds of new buildings were built, and a new administrative center was created with Svoboda Square, uh, 12 hectare, uh, hectare square and buildings. And here are some of them. Uh, the first one, uh, this is uh, House of State Industry, built in 1925-1928. And this is the project of this uh, of this house. Uh, the next one I would like to uh, show you. Uh, this is project house. It was built in 1928, 19, 1935. And note that uh, I would like to note that uh, this is uh, its original appearance. Uh, and later, after the war, it uh, would have been rebuilt. And here the house of cooperation. We see here the project. And before uh, World War II, uh, it was only half built. And after the war, a new project in Stalin's empire was made. And here the project, like um, uh, visualization, yes, of Hotel International. Uh, it was uh, built in 1932-1936, and uh, this is a project, and after the war, it was rebuilt by the same architect uh, in this uh, Stalinist empire style with some additions uh, of portico, carnies, and other elements of this style. And uh, coming back to uh, to the topic, it was like introduction. Yes, the Metropolitan Kharkiv was also a laboratory for creation of new men uh, to form a new communal life. In parallel with global trends, including the idea of solving social and political political problems with the help of architecture, in the architecture of Metropolitan Kharkiv, were traced intra-Soviet trends, uh, the creation of new Soviet men, and the formation of concept in 2030 in Ukraine, in Kharkiv, took place largely in communication with the main social ideas of architectural global practice. Uh, in the following sequence, it was uh, uncritical borrowing of bourgeois, bourgeois models. It was garden city concept. Attempts of social innovation inspired inspire the uh, classic of urban modern uh, so socialism. Uh, and it was house commune as uh, like a reincarnation of philanster and construction of new functional special models as means of realizing the social doctrine residential combine socio-economic invention in the context of individual planning social city and it is a unique fact that metropolitan Kharkiv became a city where all four concepts were realized but we will talk about several of them today. 
Okay, so certainly propaganda was applied regarding the new lifestyle of Soviet men. Uh, the liberation of uh, women from domestic labor became one of key issues. And for example, here the child said that he is bored at home and uh, uh, in the kindergarten is good and fun for him or for her. And um, uh, more slides uh, regarding propaganda, yeah? Uh, so, uh, and uh, we, need to, we need to point uh, that interest of uh, Ukrainian Soviet architects was focused on the search for methods of managing social processes through architecture, and there were steps taken to transform the family way of life. And the traditional uh, function of the women in the family were distributed among new specialized institutions. Child care was transformed to nurseries, kindergartens, and schools. Um, the performance of housework was transferred to newly created types of institutions. This is, this is a, a kitchen, factories, and laundries. And women, freed from domestic uh, cares, was to become a full-fledged worker. Thus, the minimum unit, unit of society was to be a collective, not a family. And the ideas of the common life and cultural enlightenment which were implemented in the 1920s and early 30s required a new topology of architectural facilities that would embed the latest functions. Uh, the intended change in society and family pushed architects to develop new topologies and concept of housing. And uh, in this way, these types of building appeared and the house was divided into different functions with a new developed pu public and service complexes. And here we'd like to show major types of buildings uh, that have um, uh, become um, a propaganda medium. This is clubs and uh, service uh, houses or uh, complexes. Uh, so, uh, these are clubs, and you can see there were uh, quite a lot of them in Kharkiv. And according to the memories of eyewitnesses, a lot of clubs in the 20s, 30s, or the 20th century could not accommodate all the, for example, theater groups uh, that were then. And clubs, theaters, and other amateur groups were massively filled with cerebral basements of the capital Kharkiv, and the mass of these collectives developed in pro-Ukrainian idea. And just one remark. And then, uh, when in pre-World War II years, the Soviet occupied by uh, uh, Soviet, Soviet Union Ukraine, according to USSR leadership, had to forget all national ideas, the cultural, so writers, uh, actors, and so on. Uh, so this cultural elite was repressed and shoot. And here we see the house, uh, this is uh, house Slova or word, uh, for literators and cultural workers and artists. On, on the right in this list, uh, uh, of tenants, most of whom uh, were shot and, shot and repressed. And coming back to the clubs, uh, they all had a hall for uh, performances. They usually had reading rooms. We just look through these slides. Uh, it was reading rooms, rooms for uh, group activities and other joint leisure activities. And of course, there was corner with portrait of Lenin. Yeah, so this is the examples of some, some prominent examples of clubs in Kharkiv. And uh, this club um, uh, in Kharkiv tractor plant uh, um, region. And uh, I would like to just to remark that this kindergarten, and it was, of course, uh, the part of this laboratory for formation in you in you men because from the childhood it's easier to form than you and then you a way of thinking and so on and uh, now we're going through the visuals um, um, visuals of uh, residential house with services and uh, they were uh, there were a lot of them and um, 
In the following slide, we will see the example of this assist uh, living facilities and uh, the social city of Kharkiv tractor plant as well. And uh, this is uh, communal, communal uh, house commune inspired by ideas of Fourier philanthropy creation. And um, uh, here we will see this is uh, this is residential um, districts uh, behind the Dershprom. Uh, so uh, here we will see the blocks, sometimes with full flats, sometimes with flats without kitchens or baths, uh, but uh, with a developed service sector with kindergartens, schools, laundries, and so on. And most of them were located in central part of Kharkiv. So this is, for example, a residential combine red industrialist. It was built uh, at the age of 20s and 30s. And this is like a um, uh, contemporary view. And this is another one. This is uh, the house of specialists. It was uh, as well with schools and all the services in, embedded in this complex. Uh, here are the um, uh, uh, quarter block uh, new life. Uh, these uh, um, flats were without kitchen. It was there was an intention to have the bath and the, um, the kitchen, uh, the factory kitchen uh, here. It's in the number 20. And uh, here the another one, a block, uh, another one building. This is uh, with services. Uh, it's uh, in the center of Kharkiv as well. And uh, this one is near the railway station. This is residential complex uh, of Pivdena Zaliznica. Uh, uh, it's a southern railway station. This is with services, kindergartens, and schools, and dormitory, and general store in the first floor. Yeah, and uh, uh, let's uh, have a look uh, at uh, Socialist City. It was built in 1932. Uh, uh, this is a settlement of Kharkiv tractor, uh, tractor plant built on the heroes of Kharkiv Avenue, as, and it has no analogs in Europe. Uh, it's a kind of satellite city. Uh, this um, this social housing, uh, housing concept was developed on the idea of housing combined in space uh, and uh, the urbanistic model of the learners, linear city. And here the project, yes, and uh, uh, in, in red you can see just what was built. Uh, in this project, we can also see the original idea. The residential buildings were connected to the club and dining hall uh, and to the kindergartens by warm passage. It was implemented. And uh, here we see the through the model of this concept. So uh, what the conclusion I I can say that conclusion it's like three dots, but um, the laboratory for the creation of the Soviet man by means of constructivism architecture was a kind of program demonstration propaganda of the most perfect communist social order. But there were also a lab behind the curtain. Uh, this, uh, uh, this laboratory was carried out in on Carter communal flats, for example, and barracks. We can see it in red, in red mm, line uh, on the slide. And uh, so uh, a lot of people, uh, they uh, lived in the barracks. And there's just one, one example, but there were a lot of such, such places with barracks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this nice, interesting lecture and showing all those uh, really high-profile buildings. And of course, it it hurts to know that they are all uh, facing severe war damage. Um, but this is a topic we will discuss uh, um, later, I think. Um, the next uh, speaker will be Piotr Wolinski um, from Lodz University of Technology. 
It will speak about the transfer of modernism and planning of post-war Warsaw and Singapore. So this gives us a good example of uh, how the idea of modernism really spread uh, throughout the world. Um, well, Piotr Walensky graduated from the Faculty of Architecture at the Krakow University of Technology in 2007. Since 2020, he has been a PhD student at Large University of Technology. He's an active architect, member of the Mazovian Chamber of Architects of the Republic of Poland and the Warsaw branch of the Association of Polish Architects. He is busy with urban issues, participates in design works related to buildings of exceptional cultural value. As a PhD student, he researches the achievements of architect and urban planner Christian Olszewski. I hope I spell it right. It's off the, the, the funny part. German guys bring out Polish or other names. Uh, this is uh, really. And his participation in the planning of uh, contemporary Singapore. So he believes in the word of Michael Dennis that we should once again learn that, I quote, uh, cities are urban spaces, not objects should learn how to recreate urban architecture and urban landscapes and learn that cities should be used to live in, not to be an urban space that you commute from uh, to from the suburbs. So, Hello, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Piotr Walinski and I would like to speak uh, briefly about um, the Warsaw Poland and Singapore, uh, I will try to speak how Warsaw uh, influenced Singapore uh, and uh, I will tell you about uh, Krystyn Olszewski who was involved in this uh, transfer of uh, knowledge and modernism into the Singapore. Uh, due to, uh, due to their, their size, importance, and geographical location uh, on the outskirts of different worlds and civilizations, both, I mean Warsaw and Singapore, were shaped between the globally clashing co concepts of communism and capitalism, colonialism and political and economic independence. Uh, they were in the field of cons uh, confrontation between different civilizational views. Warsaw and Singapore were similarly affect affected by war damage. In both cases, uh, after the war, they were ruled by the centralized authority building forms of a controlled economy. Uh, Poland and Singapore modernized the urban structure, created a new society, and modern nation. The goal that was set in Poland and Singapore, but also in other places of the post-war uh, post world, was to build a new image of the state and the nation. These modern organizations and structures were supposed to be the opposite of the historical ones, allegedly responsible for numerous misfortunes. The universal, universal, universality of modernist architectural and urban postulates, written down in the chapter, uh, the Athens chapter, uh, harmonized with global tendencies, regardless of whether those accompanying the introduction of communism in Poland uh, or forms of capitalism, although partly based on economic planning in Singapore. These various political and economic conditions, in each case, constituted fertile ground for modernist proposals uh, because of the mechanisms contained in these proposals for the effective exercise of power uh, through the control of economic and social development, through the control of the way in which man functions in society and in the state, through the coordination of production, employment, with housing and transport, and unfortunately, uh, but uh, also through the acceptance of restrictions on private property rights. All of this on a mass scale in a completely new paradigm of understanding man as a cog in the social machine 
society as an economic resource of the state and the goal of political supervision, the city as a matrix of socioeconomic mechanisms. Uh, by the way, important information is that those are the photographs of Kristin Olszewski, who uh, made it by himself in Singapore in the 60s. Uh, on the other hand, modernism, together with new construction and transport technologies, promised a quick solution to real social problems on a large scale, overcrowding, lack of housing resources, lack of basic hygienic and s sanitary conditions. It promised a solution as violent as, it cause, uh, as the causes which produced the problems. Modernization became a useful tool for the communists to take over the, uh, and consolidate power in Poland and to meet social needs related for example, to housing for a wide scale. It was beneficial to Singapore's social and political organization at a time when colonialism was losing its power and the British began to withdraw from the controlled territory. After World War II, the island was affected by a large influx of people looking for employment and faced the problem of overpopulation and spontaneous, substandard, and insufficient housing development. The similarity to the post-war return of people to destroyed Warsaw is quite clear. The ideas of modernism in the period after the Industrial Revolution, during the formation of British concepts of planning decentralized centers, building new cities, garden cities, coexisted with the emergence of a new relationship between architects and urban planners, with politicians striving to achieve economic and social goals. Architects and planners gave the tools for managing the state, city, and society to its managers, politicians. Modernism offered a promising proposal for planning of a national, regional, uh, at a national, regional, and city levels. For this reason, it was all the more effective and allowed for more spectacular effects, the more centralized, omnipotent, and controlling the authority was. Modernism that enabled comprehensive planning of the city with the surrounding region, coordination of social, social uh, economic functions, housing, work, production, and consumption. Polish architects and urban planners working on the issues of social housing and the industrialization of construction already in the, in the 20s became the staff building the foundations and methods of the methods and were used for the post-war reconstruction of Warsaw. Polish rich theoretical and practical as well achievements proved to be crucial for the political, economic and social organization of Singapore. The widespread housing shortage in interwar Poland, as well as the emerging views of social, cultural, political, and architectural issues of, in Poland, as well as intellectual circles open to the influences of Berlin, Weimar, and Moscow, led to the crystallization of urban planning concepts, which were appreciated by Siam representatives. Shimon Sirkus and Jan Chmielewski's design of functional Warsaw played a special role in this. Earlier, caution ideas after the war in the hands of the communist authorities became the basis for the general plan of Warsaw, which was designed and implemented on a grand scale and without compromise. Taking advantage of the intellectual background of pre-war Poland, the popularity of universality, universality of modernist ideas, an important participant in the planning of post-war Warsaw came to Singapore in the 60s. It was Kristin Olszewski. Carried by the global recognition for the achievements of the urban planners involved in the reconstruction of Warsaw, Skopje, and reconstruction, reconstruction of Baghdad, he drew on contacts with the United Nations and international relations with the countries 
of the socialist bloc. At that time, the Singapore authorities, after declaring independence, set the economic, political, and social goals of the new state. Spatial planning has become the basic tool for achieving these goals. The state was unable to organize tasks on its own. The problem was the lack of personnel who could plan and rebuild the country. The UN became the global patron of modernism in Singapore, indicating how to implement changes and appointing experts who set directions. One of them was mentioned, Christian Olszewski, who became the general designer of the Singapore uh, concept plan in 1971. This project is still considered the basis for the city's development. Christian Olszewski, the designer of the 1964 Warsaw General Plan, later the designer of the Singapore Concept Plan of 1971, became a participant in the transfer of modernism. It was a transfer of first-class Polish urban planning competences dating back to the achievements of the functional Warsaw. These concepts were also at the core of the European ideas contained in the Athens Char Charter in 1933. They arose from the experience of repairing Western cities after the Industrial Revolution from the social and political changes taking place in Europe, from the idea of building a new, better world, healthy, of healthy and comfortable cities for the broad masses of the population. Along with this, an effective tool for shaping and controlling the development of society and economy was sent to Singapore. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and you broke the time record. <laughs> so, perfect. Um, the next and last uh, speaker of the panel will be Mihai Wisniewski, um, which I already know because also he's part of our ETIM initiative. Um, he will talk about when the news is becoming old, the case of post-war housing in Poland. Mihai Wisniewski holds a PhD, works at the Institute of Architecture Foundation, FAA, FAI, has obtained a PhD in art history at Jagiellonian University in 2010 and a Master of um, Arts in uh, Architecture at the Krakow University of Technology. He works as an assistant professor in the Department uh, of Economic and Social History and also UNESCO Chair for Heritage and Urban Studies at the International Council, Cultural Council in Krakow, called ICC. He's a member of the board of the Institute of Architecture Foundation, and his research interests include the history of architecture, urban studies, cultural heritage management, and he's an author of many scientific and popularizing publications devoted to the architecture of Krakow and Poland in the 19th and 20th centuries. He's also a co-author of exhibitions, and publications created by the Institute of the Architecture Foundation team, including the website of the Krakowski Slav Modernism, <laughs> the Krakow Trace of Modernism. <laughs> the floor is yours, yes, Mihai. Please. Thank you so much for uh, this presentation, and thank you so much for uh, invitation to this uh, extremely uh, impressive and uh, so very uh, important conference, uh, in my opinion. Uh, this is the fifth panel dedicated to the new communities, new buildings, new people. Uh, I would like to focus on the issue of how, uh, for how long uh, the new can be new and when actually it comes old, because uh, it helps us to bring some kind of a frame for the discussion about heritage and to find the clue of when the modern architecture is becoming the, uh, the heritage uh, that we are talking here so much during this day. Uh, this year, uh, in Poland, we celebrate the 55th anniversary of the publication of Siegfried Gideon, Space, Time and Architecture. Uh, since it was published, uh, uh, it 
it produced uh, an enormous influence on the few generation of Polish architects. Uh, however, Gideon was known very well uh, already earlier in Poland, actually before the World War II. Helena Circus mentioned yesterday was a very close collaborator of him. Uh, then their roads split to uh, different directions, but anyway, uh, there was this connection to this uh, enormous interpretator and uh, translator of uh, the modern uh, architecture. Uh, the part of the title of his book is Time, and uh, in his narrative, time is a kind of an opportunity and also an instrument for defining the new model of uh, architecture. So uh, I would like to start with this uh, very point, asking the question uh, uh, about the time, uh, which is um, actually ambivalent in relation to architecture, the modern architecture, which is supposed to appreciate the future. And uh, uh, I was wondering what was the moment when Polish architecture was really appreciating the future? What was this crucial time, crucial day? And uh, I found out that it was 1977. Uh, at that time, Warsaw, so the opening of the exhibition Cosmos 77, Cosmos 77. Uh, it was a presentation of the Soviet achievements in Cosmos, uh, in the space. The exhibition was visited by uh, 600,000 people, so it was like a futurama of uh, New York uh, World Fairs of 1930 nine for Poland. Uh, there were some uh, elements of the Soviet uh, technology. Uh, Unochot was there, uh, just came back from the moon. And uh, this exhibition uh, came to Poland in the moment when the modernity was in this very, very zenith, top of its influence, top of its uh, importance. However, I should say that 1977 is a moment when there are already first shortages in shopping in Poland and the crisis is already there. You have to have uh, special coupons to buy sugar uh, at stores, so Cosmos represents some abstract uh, frame uh, for the future that is going to come, but today we have to uh, use these coupons uh, to somehow uh, deal with our uh, contemporary problems. Uh, this uh, exhibition was uh, largely presented and spoken in the Polish media, also in the architectural uh, magazines, uh, proposing some high-tech approach uh, for the better uh, design. 1976-1977, but at uh, the same time, uh, Polish cinematography was producing the biggest film of Poland ever. The film was never completed. The name was On the Silver Globe. It was a science fiction uh, story based on the book, a trilogy from the turn of the 19th and the 20th century. Uh, the film was produced by Andrzej Żuławski. To a certain extent, he was structuralized his memories from the wartime. He was a witness of the Holocaust events in the city of Lviv, uh, in, Lviv uh, in, the in early 1940s. And this science fiction story was uh, written by his uncle, actually, uh, was uh, a kind of a way to deal with one of the most uh, universal and most problematic issues dedicated to the history of Poland, and not only Poland, of the 20th century on the Silver Globe. Uh, there is a part of this movie that uh, during which uh, we can observe, the, the movie was never uh, completed. 80% of the movie was uh, prepared and then production was stopped. There was a cut of the budget, um, game was over. Uh, the film in the shorter way was uh, put to the cinemas in 1980. Eight. Andrzej Żuławski, the director, was already uh, away, living in France, producing new movies um, there. Uh, but uh, uh, why I'm referring this very, uh, this very movie? Uh, in Warsaw, there is this Cosmos 77, but here we can see the streets of the city of Krakow that I'm coming from. 
Uh, and uh, this is the Kazimierz, the former Jewish quarter of the city of Krakow in 1978. It was a perfect scenery for the catastrophic movies about the end of the world. The last people on the earth are fighting with some demogorgons of uh, 1970s that were supposed to eat uh, all the life that uh, is on the earth still existing. And this is uh, Josefa Street. Uh, in Kazimierz district. Uh, uh, at that time, it uh, didn't need to be uh, especially prepared to uh, be a scenery for the catastrophic movie. Uh, 1978, when these very shots were uh, prepared, it's a moment when the city of Krakow was put on the UNESCO World Heritage List. As one of the 11 first sites, uh, together with Yellowstone, uh, Quito, Gore Island, uh, among the others. It was put on the list under criteria four. We've discuss, we, we discussed yesterday the issue of OUV and uh, criteria of UNESCO inscription, so uh, criteria four, but it was put not because of the beauty of architecture. Criteria four is about uh, this very issue. Uh, it was rather the warning sign for the authorities of Poland and of Krakow concerning the uh, ecological destruction and disaster of the city of Krakow. Uh, in the late 1940s, the city was turned into a hub for the production of steel, raw steel. Seven millions of tons in the late 1970s was producing enormous uh, disaster, almost a catastrophe for the cultural heritage of the city of Krakow. So the Cosmos 77 was presenting the future, but the reality was not in Warsaw, was rather in the places like Krakow, not mentioning the other places. Uh, of course, Vladimir Lenin's steel mill in Krakow used to look like that. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of the books uh, from that era, Klęska Ekologiczna Krakowa, the ecological disaster of Krakow, as it was named. And here you can see the smokes over the uh, chimneys of the uh, Lenin factory in Krakow producing the uh, pollution. Uh, late 70s and especially 1980s, it's a time of this, let's say, ecological approach, uh, ecological turn in discussion about the city. It's a beginning of the postmodernism. Uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Muravanski brought Venice uh, to his lecture and uh, example of Kaciari. Uh, among the others, it was Gianugo Polezello who came to Krakow in the early 1980s, introducing to a certain extent postmodernism to the local uh, practice of architecture. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Polish postmodernism. Uh, it is not the place and time for that. Uh, but um, uh, what I want to say is that 1980s is a time of the very strong uh, shift from modern to uh, a different model. On the one hand side is an ecological reflection, on the other hand side, uh, 1980s is a time when Poles, still in the communist bloc, were already beaten by the neoliberal neo capitalism. Uh, yesterday, Professor York uh, Haspel mentioned the 1987 Ronald Reagan speech a few meters away from the place where we are right now. Mr. Gorbachev turned down this wall. 1987, one of the uh, Polish uh, magazines for architecture, Mój Dom, My House, uh, presented a paper about not so very Soviet or communist uh, or even Polish building. This building was Trump Tower in New York. The wall was still there. Polish magazines were already presenting Trump Tower. Donald Trump was a hero for the Polish media in the 90s, by the way, but it's a different story that I'm not going to dive into. Anyway, uh, here are, let's say, two factors that were shaping the uh, consciousness and imagination of Poles, Polish society, and uh, Polish architects uh, of that very uh, era. Yesterday, the issue of the environment around the uh, Palace of Culture in Warsaw was discussed. Uh, here is one more image from the 1990, this time no cosmos, but the very cruel reality of the economic transformation of Poland of that very era when a kind of a bazaar was uh, arranged uh, quite haphazardly. Uh, and immediately after the political turn all around this very place. Today we are discussing 
some fancy building being built in the very close neighborhood, but in the 1990s it was a different story. Uh, I, I was already touching the Polish cinematography, uh, so I should uh, refer also to this issue that uh, Polish cinematography in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, from time to time was touching the issue of housing and of architecture, uh, using it mainly as a critique of the everyday life, from time to time producing some universal uh, narratives, like it was in the case of uh, the Kalog by Krzysztof Kieślowski, mentioned uh, also yesterday uh, in the remark of Professor Morawanski. Uh, but uh, uh, what I want to say is that uh, cinematography today uh, is also a very good uh, tool to measure the reaction to the uh, new era and uh, to see how the new times uh, were um, seeing the architecture of the previous times. Uh, and uh, yesterday uh, it was discussed this very case, I mean Przyczółek Grochowski in Warsaw, uh, this very housing estate became one of the heroes of uh, serial movies and also some comedies, however not so very funny, but anyway uh, some pop culture of Poland of uh, late 90s and early 2000s usually presenting this very Oscar Hansen open form as a symbol of a slam. The worst of worst uh, is at Przyczółek Grochowski. This was what Polish uh, uh, TV used to wanted to say. Uh, this architecture, especially in this very movie, uh, was presenting this uh, uh, was presented as a space that is shaping people in some way, and they have some mental disorders. Uh, anyway, modern architecture, uh, just in the beginning of the 21st century, in the Polish discourse of pop media, uh, was presented in the worst uh, possible way. And uh, why I'm mentioning that? It is exactly the same time. Uh, when the attitude to this architecture is uh, presented not only uh, through the jokes, uh, through some cultural narratives like movies or, uh, or papers, but uh, also the money are coming. We are already a part of you. Uh, there are some new developments being uh, organized uh, all over the country. And uh, here are some examples of what was going on with the uh, Polish uh, socialist modernist architecture at the time. Super Sam, one of the highlights, was turned down uh, 2006. Uh, and uh, yesterday, during the presentation about the Skopje, we heard about the group of the architect called the Tigers. The, the highlights uh, of their work uh, used to be in Katowice, the main train station. It was uh, devastated uh, in 2010. Uh, in <coughs> case of Warsaw, right now there is a skyscraper, let's call it this way, uh, in this place. Uh, in here, there is an enormously huge uh, shopping uh, center. Uh, and uh, this was one of the strategies of dealing with this uh, socialist modernist architecture that was seen as a uh, uncomprehensive towards the new era, towards the new times, uh, not functional, uh, badly uh, dealing with the uh, time passing and so on and so uh, and so on. At uh, the same time, uh, also the housing architecture was being put under some very specific treatment, namely the thermomodernization. Let's meet the uh, temperature and climate criteria, uh, putting the styrofoam on the buildings. Uh, I'm not going to name the city, which is presented here, but this image uh, is quite common, or, or was quite common. It is changing right now. Uh, was quite common uh, like 10 or 15 uh, years ago. Uh, architecture of post-war period was uh, criticized because of being grayish, so now let's go to a different direction. But uh, these uh, actions uh, in Poland uh, produce some new discourse. And yet today in the morning we could hear about young people in Kiev uh, fighting for uh, their heritage in Poland. It was to a certain extent similar. Uh, these young people maybe are not so young anymore, but anyway, uh, uh, some 10, 15 years ago they started to deal with this very 
um, uh, problematic, um, to a certain extent, dissonant uh, heritage. Uh, I'm presenting the cover of the book by Philip Springer, a very renowned Polish uh, author, Badly Born. It was a series of reportages, uh, papers dedicated to some particular buildings uh, that were seen as a dissonant. Uh, and uh, this was the beginning of some, let's say, uh, events uh, uh, that uh, were um, dealing with this kind of architecture, dealing with this kind of heritage. Uh, one of them happened, uh, one of such events, quite important for this discussion, hap happened in Krakow and was uh, connected to uh, Krakowia Hotel. Uh, the building from the mid-1960s that was bought by a real estate developer who decided to, who presented that uh, his wish is to demolish it and to uh, turn it uh, into the shopping mall. Uh, this very, uh, this very uh, proposal uh, brought a lot of attention and uh, started the discussion about the value of uh, this architecture. Uh, the NGO that I represent, the Institute of Architecture, uh, we prepared a book with the author of the building, uh, Professor Sanskiewicz, and later on we also prepared an exhibition dedicated to the building and to the oeuvre of this very intriguing uh, author. Uh, there was also a uh, there was also a, a kind of a civic action, a protest against um, uh, demolition of the uh, of the building. I'm very happy to see in this room some of the uh, colleagues who were involved in this very action. I see Łukasz Gazur, I see Kasper Kempiński. Uh, uh, it was 2014 uh, when um, uh, the event called Greed, the city uh, was very useful to bring young people and to bring attention uh, concerning the value of the post-war modern uh, architecture. But uh, this very event uh, was to a certain extent accelerator or, or one of the accelerators. I don't want to somehow overestimate the meaning of this very one. There were many of them. Uh, and uh, some 10 years ago, the some shift already happened. Uh, there were more and more uh, more sensitive actions towards this very kind of architecture. Uh, for instance, in Wrocław, uh, the Grunwaldzki Square estate, a part of the city that was entirely damaged, erased uh, at the very end of the World War II. Uh, in the 60s uh, was a place of this very development and um, some 10 years ago, the renovation started with um, some fragility concerning the color and uh, quality of this architecture. Uh, this renovation was connected with the large-scale exhibition dedicated to the author of this project, um, Jadwiga grabowska Havlakowa. Exhibition was held at the Museum of Architecture in, uh, in Wrocław. Uh, and there were more and more of such uh, projects, better, there can be a scale of, uh, of, of, of various actions. I'm not going to go to the details, but all over the Poland you can find uh, that this, uh, let's say, pinkish revolution was not so very pinkish anymore, uh, and more sensitive towards the past as well. Uh, I guess the super unit uh, in Katowice and renovation of this very building was one of the best example of uh, bringing this new approach to this kind of architecture. Uh, uh, there were also some serious discussions about the public buildings, uh, and a uh, quite important one was the main train station in Warsaw. Unlike in Katowice, it was not demolished. Uh, the <laughs> big shopping center was already there ne next, next by, so there was no need for the uh, plot of land, and uh, maybe this was one of the reasons why the building was uh, renovated, uh, partly uh, turned away, partly uh, built uh, back, but uh, more or less uh, it is um, uh, what was there uh, before. Uh, in uh, some cases, uh, the scale of renovation was uh, very deep. I mean that almost uh, like 80% of the structure was changed, and this is the case of the bus station in Kielce, UFO of Kielce. Uh, 
uh, was also supposed to be turned into a shopping mall. There was also a plan to demolish it and bring the new architecture there. But finally, because of the local activists also and uh, sensitivity of some people from the town hall of Kielce, it was uh, possible to keep it as it, uh, almost as it is. Uh, concerning the public buildings, uh, I think the uh, best example of renovation was the, uh, again, uh, Katowice, this time Saucer, the very important sports center built in the uh, turn of the 60s and 70s. This time there was no uh, wish to demolish it, but uh, the renovation was uh, run in a quite, let's say, sensitive way towards the structure of this quite unique uh, construction. And uh, coming to the conclusion, uh, I don't want to leave uh, this story presenting that there used to be bad times, now we have the good times. Uh, time is uh, much more complicated. Uh, there are uh, many ups and downs. And uh, at the very end, I would like to um, approach the uh, few buildings by Tomasz Mankowski. Uh, the architect of Krakow, um, uh, who, like um, uh, Kristen Olszewski, was active abroad. Uh, we heard about the Singapore uh, just before. Uh, Mankowski was active in Baghdad and in Iraq, uh, in the, especially in the 70s, organizing a large-scale project for the housing development in um, Iraq that used to be a close ally to Poland. Um, and um, uh, I want to point your attention to one of his projects, namely the uh, Academy of Mining and Metallurgy in Krakow dormitories, uh, the students' uh, dormitories uh, of the large-scale university, a kind of an MIT of uh, Krakow. Uh, maybe too much, but anyway, uh, it's a very big school. Uh, in the 1960s, Mankowski and his team, uh, they designed a modern layout uh, for development of uh, this very housing unit. Uh, it still exists. Uh, most of the buildings are in a quite well shape. Uh, they were uh, thermo-isolated. Uh, luckily, the colors were not changed. However, it is not the original structure anymore. And there were many interferences that might be seen as uh, problematic. But anyway, uh, it is uh, still there. The urban layout, the space, uh, more or less as it was in the uh, 60s. However, uh, there were also two buildings of the uh, student canteens, this very one and this very one. And uh, quite recently, the university decided to uh, change one of them into a new uh, student center. Uh, it was quite funny because for the 100th anniversary of the school, uh, they decided to build the brewery. Uh, as an achievement, I don't know, scientific achievement of the Technical University. Um, anyway, this very new architecture that was not following the original shape was implemented to this very space. But it was not the end. Uh, there was also another such uh, building that actually could place many various functions. It could be a gallery, it could be a service building for, for many functions. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, didn't uh, happen. Uh, I took this photo in May uh, this very year uh, because of lack of urban planning, because of no protection of this very building. Uh, it was simply impossible to stop this demolition, uh, which actually happened. The building do not exist uh, anymore. What we have are the images. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I wanted to present various strategies uh, dedicated to um, dealing with this very difficult architecture uh, that uh, Poles were used to love with, later on became uh, hating it. Um, but um, uh, some um, uh, new ideas, some new discourse was uh, implemented in the last 10, 15 years. Um, anyway, it was still not enough to uh, make uh, some strategical uh, ideas and developments concerning this very architecture, uh, even in the places like the city of Krakow. Thank you so very much.
so you can just stay here <laughs> and everybody um, from this panel join the stage please um, so wow I don't know how you feel but um, I'm really again overwhelmed by all these uh, important and valuable topics that were touched uh, during this session um, and I guess you all have uh, many questions. Uh, we touched uh, things like education, the power of symbol, the power of uh, um, yeah, educating people. We have uh, touched uh, the problem of regularization against uh, rather futuristic mass theory buildings and also economic, ecological <coughs> uh, things. Uh, and economic pressure, which uh, forces demolition, the question who uh, appreciates what, and different strategies of reuse and modernization. So, um, well, I think um, I just open the mic for, for everyone so that you can decide on which topic of all those uh, we could uh, probably start. Is there anyone? Um, Okay. <laughs> yeah, please. I'll ask a question. Uh, I have two questions, and I, um, my first one is for Dr. Vishnevsky. Good pronunciation, almost there. Uh, the question is in regard to actors in these uh, processes, because you mentioned uh, your final sentence was how the Poles uh, hated them, liked them, laughed with them. I'm assuming quite a few cried with them. Uh, so my question is now in this neoliberal rebuilding and building and building and building era, uh, who are the actors on one hand, and on the other, um, the users of these spaces, perhaps in regard to housing, what is the response to, to uh, to these uh, events, let's call them. And my second question would be for Dr. Uh, Antonenko. I'm very curious because my work deals with post-war former Yugoslavia. So I'm very curious when you mentioned that you prefer b uh, people to survive um, instead of buildings to survive. And I'm very curious, um, and this is perhaps not necessarily a fair question, it's very broad. How do you see this in the post-war uh, era because uh, I'm noticing perhaps in the last 15 years, in particular in American academia, there is an overwhelming emphasis of, okay, we spoke about the people, but let's now talk about the buildings, let's preserve the buildings, without necessarily taking into account users of these buildings and people who might have different, um, let's say, opinions. Thank you both. Uh, thank you for your question. It's um, very important um, uh, for us because in now, if um, some realistic scenario, realistic scenario will be that we have big development company which are very close to politicians. And now when people need some housing, there are some um, these people which have uh, big influence. They build uh, architecture big to this dwelling without any participation. I hope, and um, I'm very close with NGOs, uh, which um, has ideas about how to grow in uh, community leaders in uh, Ukraine. I hope that uh, this uh, acting will be, and we will have some examples when we might make this community, this community are, but we strengthen these communities. We find people who will be responsible, who might take this response for themselves to take care for housing and for the territory. Uh, because we don't have such experience like in Germany when there is a housing companies and uh, participating, uh, moving, uh, and uh, experience that they might um, hold it. It's sad, but I hope for this. Thank you. The actors, uh, I see three of them on the level of monument restoration. It is in general state. However, in the big cities like Krakow or Warsaw, 
Uh, there is also the local uh, authorities for monument restoration that are responsible for especially the 20th century uh, heritage, and this is the case of Krakow. Uh, local uh, authorities and uh, the um, local governments are quite strong in Poland, I have to say, uh, are also responsible for the uh, urban planning since 1990. And uh, this is one of the uh, big challenges that we are facing right now, especially that some 20 years ago the uh, um, law for urban planning was changed. And uh, uh, cities like Krakow uh, lost their uh, main uh, urban plans uh, and have been forced to develop the so-called local uh, um, plans. Uh, after 20 years, the city of Krakow is covered in some 70% with these local plans. So uh, planning, uh, what I want to say is that planning uh, in my country right now is in a kind of a crisis. It's a kind of a permanent crisis. And to understand the nature of this crisis, I should say that 40% of housing units in Krakow right now, uh, they've been built in the last 25 years. So uh, with uh, lack of regulation, there was uh, enormous development uh, and enormous uh, mm, attack uh, on the uh, spaces that were very easy to develop new, with new buildings. Concerning the housing, uh, I should say that uh, neoliberalism was to a certain extent helpful in the sense that uh, following the uh, especially uh, a British example, uh, housing in Poland were uh, privatized. Uh, and uh, in a large scale, 1960s, 70s buildings, uh, many of them at least units uh, became private, uh, bought by the uh, tenants from the past with a relatively small amount of money they could bought. And uh, like in this Hofsiedlung uh, uh, that you presented in the beginning, there are right now hundreds of uh, owners, uh, which is a challenge, but also it somehow uh, froze's the situation. So. Oh, uh, I would like just to add something to uh, Michał's uh, lecture because like during this panel the, uh, the results for the competition for the Krakowia restoration or rebuilding were announced so uh, just the uh, next uh, next chapter to the uh, to the lecture and uh, yeah we'll see if it will be rebuilt according to these plans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go back to Malkorzata, to your uh, um, beautiful example of these uh, schools built there. And uh, perhaps I, I just want to comment on it that there was such an initiative also in the uh, Kingdom of Hungary in the beginning of 20th century and then later in Czechoslovakia in 1928 uh, because of this jubilee, uh, like um, decade of existing of the Republican. Um, my question would be, if there was also a kind of, uh, let's say, um, reformation of a school system behind it or a kind of ideological turn in, let's say, like spreading the Polish culture or, or language in this kind of region. Thank you. And it follows up um, the, the same question because um, it's interesting because in Lithuanian state, they also built numbers of schools, especially on the border, also by spreading the... It's a national project, it's, a, it's a very likely. But my follow-up question will be, in your uh, present, uh, abstract, you say that uh, these uh, valuable modernist buildings are unwanted heritage. So why do you make this decision that it's unwanted? Did you have the resident's opinion or how do you come to this conclusion that it's unwanted? Um, uh, so first maybe to, um, to the school system in Poland at the, maybe know, is it on? <laughs> it's shifted. It's shifted on, so I just have to yeah. speak louder. Okay, um, yes, there was, um, I try to concentrate on architecture, but uh, yes, there was a big educational um, schooling projects, uh, project in Poland in this time. 
as in all other countries, it had um, something to do with the idea of the new democratic state in which every citizen should be able to read and write, which was not so obvious. Um, uh, the Polish state was, um, um, had the uh, challenge of um, uniting three different schooling systems from the three partitions, and whereas in uh, Prussia it was uh, pretty well um, implemented and the um, um, uh, and uh, I'm lacking a word but it's okay <laughs> and most of the children were going to school and had the had the chance for education it was uh, somewhat worse in Austria and Hungary empire but uh, the uh, Russian part of the partition this this area was definitely underdeveloped and both uh, Lithuania and Poland had to, um, uh, had to build really a lot of schools. So this project was only part of the, these were not all the schools that were built in this region in this time. There were some not Piłsudski schools uh, built in, uh, in Vilnius Voivodeship at, at the same time, but there was also plenty of other schools in, in other uh, regions. So yes, there was a huge uh, reformation of education and it was also changing uh, within this time. I um, believe it um, all children were supposed to have possibility of seven years of education but it was also changing and the schools in the countryside area were areas were a little bit different and were not giving the same opportunities to to the people as the, the schools in the cities. Um, and uh, to the abstract uh, I don't, I think I wanted to, um, no, I don't, I didn't get this uh, feeling when being in uh, uh, Lithuania and seeing the schools and also in the, in the archives, everyone was very uh, supportive. I had a little bit of um, um, stress going to the villages and how I am, uh, how I will be able to explain why I'm taking pictures of, of the schools. Uh, but uh, no, so it's, um, uh, I think I rewrote the abstract la <laughs> later and it's still the, the older version. Um, and wanted in the sense that I, um, from what I know, Piłsudski is not beloved figure in Lithuania. <laughs> and, and the institution carrying his name, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's the thing. But what I um, experienced in, in the research is that um, the communities, and when I try to look for more informal information about the schools, there is a lot of sympathy towards the buildings uh, themselves. They, many of them were painted green later, and they go by green schools. There is one, um, uh, there is a few schools that are green now, so, uh, so they're called green schools. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Is this also a, a question of form? Because when I thought, um, when I compared the different uh, strategies of really big projects, like to build a hundred schools or to build a whole city, then of course uh, you have to deal with the question of design. And as for the schools, it was a functional layout in a way modern, but also with some traditional elements, which is the complete opposite uh, what we saw in, in Warsaw and Singapore. But first, maybe, did you find something, was there some kind of master plan or was this a ministry for religious beliefs? Is this uh, an, an anonymous uh, design or? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, was, um, I was trying to say it in the presentation. I don't know the name of the author, uh -huh. but um, uh, I hope, I still haven't done it, but I hope to reconstruct the team or the possible authors. Um, it's, um, I think part of the sympathy is the, uh, the fact that the schools are not, um, I, they, they don't have very foreign form in, in themselves, but they also, I think they were pretty, pretty good schools where, where children could learn. I like this mix with this Doric column, like bringing <coughs> 
something from ancient Greece to, uh, to the countryside as a symbol of education. This, I think, is nice. But I guess people like these schools because in the, um, uh, in the time, a lot of children were really dreaming of going to school. Uh, and um, getting this opportunity, I think it's, it's another reason. Okay. I I just have a, one comment. It's maybe to this unwanted uh, unwanted heritage because you mentioned that the schools are not protected in like as a heritage in any way, and you said uh, it was a national project. I would say it was more nationalistic project in a way colonial project of bringing Polish language and colonizing this area, which was uh, in the twenties basically. When the, when the Republic was, was forming, the, the, the Piłsudski, just in the very last moment, went there with the army and kind of cut off Vilnius and, and took it for Poland. So I, I see this, this project, as a really interesting question in the context of shared heritage in Europe, how we can deal with this. Because I can understand it's not protected from the Lithuanian because it's also a symbol of kind of, of oppression of the time. Like, I could suppose. That's just my uh, like provocation. Uh, on the other hand, it's it's kind of impor uh, important part of the Polish history from that time. So I think it could be a nice bridge between the countries of talking about the problematic history from the 20th century. But you know, it's just. Yeah, it might sound very intriguing, but I don't uh, like to support the speculation because I think it's more of an invented problem. Uh, I'm very much uh, fascinated by this research and I think it should be published also in Lithuania because uh, it's not, um, it doesn't seem to be as uh, deliberately unwanted or problematic from the political side. No, it's it's, uh, not, it's not neg neglected, but it's not protected as a cultural monument because of not recognition. People just, people just don't remember it. Be because there was a big shift of populations, ex uh, you know, forced migration and forced resettlement of peoples. So bu buildings are nice, and I, I understand uh, from, your, from your research that people appreciated uh, these, these buildings, but they do not even consider the contested history. I, I think that not in, particularly in these buildings. So. I wouldn't support to invent problem, problems where they are. <laughs> no, yeah. It's like, I don't know, at least I think Polish people, but also Lithuanian know how difficult the, the, difficult the figure of, of Piłsudski is in our common history. Not anymore. Not anymore, but like, okay, so maybe it's just my impression. But I thought it's, it's really, they are like, not, okay. Whatever. But I think it's, it, it, it would be a very good educational project to publish and to educate the society that about this project because they do not know anything. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I guess there are some problems about not uh, exactly about these buildings, but uh, the region, the histories, or kind of. This, these attitudes towards our common past, we have problems, you know. Maybe these problems are not that big any longer, you know, but the histories are different, you know. And <laughs> uh, so uh, we know that uh, when Lithuania and Poland were signing uh, different treaties, you know, they decided not <laughs> to name or put exact words, you know, because uh, there are different narratives. And, and there will be narratives. You know, uh, uh, Maria perhaps haven't uh, been very much involved in, in Vilnius region. I spent, uh, during Soviet period, I spent five years uh, uh, while avoiding service in the Soviet army. I spent as a school teacher there, you know? So I know a little bit, you know? Uh, I think uh, many things have changed. But, uh, but there are, <laughs> the, on, on a certain level, the problems are still there, you know. Uh, of course, uh, culture and, and, and research is one of the ways, you know, how can you solve them, you know, and, and 
uh, I, I don't, uh, and I fully understand that, you know, nobody looked at you, you know, as a kind of foreign kind of <laughs> enemy or, or whatever. But uh, there are some contested, contested things about Pilsudski, about General Zeligovsky, uh, and it's quite natural. Uh, and you can compare it with some other uh, European countries where you have different narratives. And, and I, th I guess we should not be afraid any longer uh, of, of, of these different, uh, different uh, stories, but they are. I uh, would like to uh, comment that in, um, um, I was uh, trying to, sen to be sensitive uh, uh, to, to those matters. Um, so um, uh, I read a book um, on uh, history of Lithuania in, in Stavi <laughs> very quickly and it's, uh, and especially when it came to the um, uh, to the languages taught at school, I, I think it, it was a big uh, uh, problem that um, reading and writing in uh, Lithuanian was not supported by the Polish state, and vice versa. The um, the uh, Polish citizens that uh, ended up in um, um, in Lithuania in the interwar period, uh, they had difficulties um, establishing uh, Polish schools. So there was this difficulty, but I'm also, I'm not a historian, I'm an architect and um, moreover mostly um, an architect in an architectural office. So I don't, I think it's very important and I really like this, this topic because it uh, makes me more sensitive to to those um, relations and, and reading the stories not as opposed to each other but rather parallel to each other. But in the end, I, I also I, I like to stick to the architecture, even though architecture is transporting ideas. All right, uh, well, another question for you, Mr. Magazata. Uh, don't, don't worry, I'm, uh, my, our, not, uh, our intention is not to grill you in life. Uh, I, we're just uh, so much involved in your, your topic. Uh, I will leave the uh, political aspect away because I'm interested with uh, one uh, detail of your uh, presentation. Uh, I'm just curious because, you know, uh, in my impression, you were so close to discovering the uh, answer for your own question about the white column as a common element of every school you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you've uh, expressed your uh, uh, impression that uh, it's so exotic in your way uh, of thinking, of uh, your way of perception, but uh, can't you remember any time of Polish history when uh, there were common and uh, very typical uh, inspiration with antiques? For example, a Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth? Well, I think it's kind of uh, obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's been... <laughs> like, I, I, I think the columns were used in the buildings for education, but they were also part of the, uh, uh, of the aristocratic villas in the countryside. That's correct. So it's also another, it's another level, and thank you, I, I didn't mention it in the... Uh, but it's, it's very typical for, for the aristocratic villa um, or like a little palace to be wooden and have have these columns at the entrance. So it it's is obvious for us, for the... people that live in a former uh, <laughs> Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth. Yeah, so it's also giving giving the children the sense that every day they can go to like an they are almost aristocrats every day. <laughs> I, I have a question to Katarina Didenk because of Sharkiv. We, we learned today and the day before there are cr six criteria for world heritage sites. There are wonderful narratives, Kaunas is one of them, and, and others, and Brasilia found one of them, Tel Aviv found a narrative, everywhere we have the narrative, but we do not yet have on the world heritage list a uh, world heritage site of the Soviet times in Eastern Europe. Kaunas is uh, earlier, and, and so my, my question is: <laughs> No, my, my question is, um, what what about Sharkiv? Is there any idea 
to think that this is a model town of not only of Soviet, but of modernization, as you showed with the typologies of the building, with the typologies of the quarters, with the Svoboda Square, with the Gazprom or Dashprom building. All this is uh, related there, it's there. And is there any initiative to think about to nominate it um, maybe later, but to be prepared that this is, from my point of view, it is um, a common heritage of the world and it should be protected and it should be published and communicated that it is of importance. If you, look, have a, if you have a look on the tentative list of Ukraine for the World Heritage nominations, there is the Dashprom building is nominated, but the last uh, site which was listed was Odessa. So the 20th century is like a, a blind field uh, in the, on the World Heritage list and I fear also in the in the local, uh, or under the locals who are responsible for deciding this. How is, is there any chance? <laughs> okay, so I, um, uh, I would like to, to look more, how to say, to, to give more spread look here on this question or just a comment because of course uh, there are a lot of architecture but I didn't show you what the result of some reconstruction of some of these buildings <laughs> because uh, a lot of them are spoiled. It wasn't my, my, my task to show you this reconstructions uh, of later later years after war years and so on. Uh, but for example, our Dersprom, it was spoiled with reconstruction, with not appropriate approaches to the reconstruction. It's not easy to put it in the list. And we have a lot of such issues in Kharkiv, unfortunately. And uh, we have problems with um, administrative sector, let's say. <laughs> Because uh, uh, we have a problem of low level of culture of this administrative sector in Kharkiv and in Ukraine. But in different cities, in different, it goes in different way. But in Kharkiv we have this. And uh, it's, it's really a problem. What to do with this spoiled building? How to, how to um, shift it, this situation? How to move this situation? How to... Uh, we can just document, yes, to describe uh, how this building looked like in 20s, 30s, and maybe, and maybe before these reconstructions. <laughs> but now we, we don't have any decision, any strict decision what to do, and we don't have the support of our administration, you see. Yeah, that's a bit... Uh, a very big topic, of course, how to deal with uh, all those war damages. Is it a, could it be a similar situation like in Skopje that uh, the international community helps to uh, rebuild things or discussing uh, whether there is a Ukrainian identity behind these buildings? Could be. Um, I think um, as you showed a lot of, of this uh, social project and we know since we also had this uh, exhibition series about modernism in Ukraine that uh, the situation is very poor so from a world heritage perspective probably the original substance uh, would be a crucial factor but on the other side I think uh, this would be a, really a perfect uh, place where international uh, solidarity could uh, help to to rebuild this really incredible uh, structure. Because I, I personally, I was impressed by two cities, which one is Kharkiv and the other is Kaunas when I was, went there. Um, because there was so much uh, incredible housing structures. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I want to add, uh, maybe you have a question why uh, Der Sprom was uh, like only only one monument. Uh, there was a um, one history uh, from near past when in the center of uh, Svoboda Square, uh, our authority wanted to put very strange 
neoclassical column. And there was a big scandal, and I took part in the comment of um, NGO Miski Reformy uh, by Alexander Narizhna when um, we put, uh, uh, go to court, and there was a process uh, that uh, strict uh, this uh, column in the sand. It was for two years. So it was one of the way uh, to, to help uh, this whole complex not to be destroyed. But the discussion that it's more right way to put not only buildings, not only square, uh, Swoboda Square, but the whole complex is Zadarspromia, uh, as we call them, and then there was several um, several streets near the Zadarspromia which need to be included. Uh, and uh, we have some initiatives in Kharkiv and um, um, former Kharkiv State uh, National University of um, uh, Civil Engineering and uh, Architecture, which now it's a part of uh, University of, how is your name, um, Economy or something, yeah? Um, but they prepared the new plan, um, historical plan, and in, in put there uh, some rethink about the physical state of the buildings and put there uh, these buildings uh, of 20s, uh, 30s too. Uh, but of course uh, now it's very um, dangerous in Kharkiv and we don't know what um, will be after the war, what will be destroyed, what will be physically uh, not destroyed but rocket attacks but uh, because people uh, don't live in these uh, buildings and uh, they destroy for, um, for this, uh, uh, no care for them. Yeah, but, but it's uh, the really important idea to, for whole uh, heritage to have this uh, example, this uh, site in UNESCO list. Thank you. If, if, I, if I may, yeah. yeah. Um, so we should understand that this is very complicated uh, um, process and uh, it is important to who are the actors of this process. So this is the local authority, the state authority, and local community, and, and um, professional community. So how it, how it looks uh, uh, now that uh, a city city doesn't appreciate this, this heritage. Because it's modern heritage is very simple, you know, and uh, so I, I actually have idea that, and authority don't, um, don't perceive this heritage as a resources for s sustainable development of the city. Because this city could be a treasure as an intellectual, a spot of intellectual tourism. Because it's uh, uh, really unique, because such cities as Lviv, uh, uh, Ivano Frankivsk, former, former um, Stanislav, and other these Asian cities. It's it's the same like in Europe, uh, a bit worse, but it is as in Europe. So here, this heritage is really the the source for sustainable development, and uh, local authority doesn't see it as a resources at all. Um, local community also, because it just. Uh, simple forms, it's not for people, it's, it's not very beautiful. And if you go to Kharkiv and even before the war, you will see that all these beautiful balconies are put with, uh, closed with um, um, kind of windows. I don't know even how to, uh, so, and it's ruined this heritage. So it's not, unfortunately, it's not so beautiful as it is uh, um, in, uh, in this picture. So it should be first the inner process of um, uh, uh, learning and teaching and uh, preparing um, the local community of Kharkiv to, uh, to have this feeling and understanding that it's, it's a treasure and also this is the, the 
the resources for, for the city. And uh, for the state level, the same. You know, you know, to put, to be on the list, in UNESCO list, uh, it's very political issue. So, and the state authority and also the UNESCO um, authority, I would say, should, should work together. So it's a lot of things uh, overlapped and we have a lot to do ahead with this. Um, Short comment. Um, yeah, uh, we were um, a bit late in time, so but just please. short. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I don't think that it is because they don't understand the form, they don't understand the community and authorities, they don't understand the value of any architecture. So it's not because the style; it's just because because they don't understand. And we need like architects, like historians, to make this level higher. We need to find the ways to make this level higher and then we we would we can <laughs> uh, we can receive this support you know that's it so there will be um, a few points left i think for the lessons learned about communication about international uh, solidarity about support and um i was asked to um tell you all that we have a short break like a 15 minutes break uh, due to the overtime, but I'm looking forward to further discussions within the breaks, although we couldn't mention all the topics now that uh, are on the, on the plate. <laughs> Thank you.